Our cells use fatty acids for a variety of different reasons, but one important reason is to actually store energy. So fatty acids are fuel molecules, and our cells store fatty acids in a form we call triglycerides or triacylglycerols. And this is what a triacylglycerol actually looks like. So we have three fatty acids, one, two, three shown in blue, which are basically attached onto this connecting molecule, this scaffolding molecule we call a glycerol. And together, this is what we call triacylglycerol or triglycerides. Now, inside our body, we essentially store potential energy in three types of macromolecules. So we have glycogen, which, are, which is a carbohydrate, we have proteins, and we have triglycerides. And notice, based on these numbers, much more energy is actually stored in triglycerides than in proteins, glycogen, or glucose. Only about 170 kilojoules are stored in glucose, and 2,500 kilojoules are stored in glycogen. In fact, these two quantities will last us about 24 hours. So, whereas carbohydrate storages are used up after about 24 hours so, so a day, Fat storage can actually help sustain the processes of our cells and our body for several weeks. And that's because it makes up the predominant portion of the total energy that is readily available to the cells of our body. So we have 420,000 kilojoules of energy that is stored in triglycerides. So what that basically means is when we run out of these two storages of energy, our body will begin to break down the triglycerides to form the high energy ATP molecules and that will last us several weeks. And after we run out of our triglyceride storages, that's when our body begins to actually break down the protein, the muscles of our body for energy. Now, the question is, what makes triglycerides so special? Why is it that our cells actually choose to store the predominant amount of energy within our fat molecules, the triglycerides, and not within, for instance, the glycogen? Well, these two properties make glyceraldehyde such a highly concentrated storage of energy. So number one is they're highly reduced molecules and number two is they're anhydrous. Now, what do we mean by highly reduced? Well, essentially, we have removed lots of electrons from the triglycerides. We have removed lots of electrons from the fatty acids. And that's important because we can actually break down the triglycerides via oxidation many, many, many times to produce a large number of molecules that we can then use to help generate those ATP energy molecules. The second reason is the fact that it's anhydrous. And what that basically means is it's free of water. We don't have hydroxyl groups attached onto the fatty acids like we do, for instance, in glycogen. And what that means is water molecules will not tend to associate with fatty acid chains. And what that means is the fatty acids will be a much high, much more concentrated form of energy storage than glycogen. In fact, for one gram of glycogen, there are about two grams of water that associates with that gram of glycogen. Why? Well, because glycogen, which consists of glucose monomers, contains many hydroxyl groups, and those hydroxyl groups are polar, and so they attract water. And so what that means is glycogen is not a very concentrated form of energy storage, like triglycerides are. So we see that the fact that triglycerides are highly reduced and anhydrous, this makes triglycerides highly compact and highly concentrated stores of metabolic cell energy. So the complete oxidation of fatty acids yields about 38 kilojoules of gram that we oxidize. And, we, and if we compare that to oxidizing carbohydrates or proteins, this only yields about 17 kilograms, uh, 17 kilojoules per gram that we actually oxidize. So we're able to actually store much more energy in these fatty acids. And when we break down these triglycerides, we can also actually form many more high energy ATP molecules.
Now, within our body, we have different types of cells that can actually store fatty acids. But there are two most important cells because these are the cells that store the predominant number of fat molecules. And this includes our fat cells, also known as adipose cells, as well as muscle cells. Now, these adipose cells, fat cells, are specialized in the sense that they store most of these triglycerides within their cytoplasm. And these triglycerides basically aggregate together to form these large fat globules inside the cytoplasm. And these fat globules actually make up the majority of the volume of these fat cells. Now muscle cells can also store these triglycerides. And muscle cells store these triglycerides predominantly to actually use them for energy production, for ATP production. Now let's briefly discuss digestion, absorption, and transport of triglycerides. So the majority of the fats that we actually ingest into our body in our diet basically are these triglycerides. Now triglycerides are, as we said earlier, are insoluble in water because they're non-pole. Remember, they're anhydrous. And what that basically means is when we ingest these triglycerides into our body, when the triglycerides make their way into the lumen of our small intestine, because the lumen is an aqueous environment, it consists of water, what that means is these triglycerides will begin to aggregate together to basically form these large fat globules. Now, our pancreas secretes special enzymes, proteolytic enzymes known as lipases. And these lipases are actually responsible for cleaving these ester bonds that exist within triacylglycerol. So we have lipases which can act on these bonds and when they cleave, let's say this bond and this bond, we basically form this monoacylglycerol and two fatty acids. And once we form these molecules, only then can these molecules actually be absorbed by the cells found in our small intestine. So our small intestine doesn't actually, or the cells of the small intestine doesn't actually absorb the triacylglycerols. Instead, it absorbs these types of molecules, the constituents, the fatty acids, and the monoacylglycerol. Now, the problem is, because of the fact that this is a nonpolar molecule and our lumen is predominantly an aqueous environment, we form these large fat globules. And the lipase enzymes can't actually get to the majority of these triglycerides because they exist at the center of the fat globules. And so our liver basically uses cholesterol molecules to help build bile salts. And the bile salts are actually stored in our gallbladder and released into the small intestine. And once the bile salts actually make their way into the small intestine, what the bile salts do is they begin to emulsify and break down those fat globules into smaller constituents. And what these Bio, uh, what these bile salts are, are they're essentially these amphipathic molecules that can associate not only with the aqueous environment in the lumen of the small intestine, but also with these fat globules. And that's exactly what allows them to actually emulsify and break down these fat globules. And once it breaks them down to the fat globules, then the lipases can actually begin to act on the individual triacylglycerols, and that can break them down to these two constituents, which then can be absorbed by the cells found in the lumen of our small intestine. So in the lumen, we basically have these aggregates of triacylglycerols, the fat globules, when our gallbladder basically secretes the bile salts that helps emulsify them into triglycerides, uh, triglycerides or triacylglycerols, and then the triglycerides are acted, um, or the lipases act on these triglycerides, breaks them down into fatty acids and monoacylglycerols, and then those are absorbed by the cells found in the small intestine. And once these fatty acids and monoacylglycerols actually make their way into the cell, into the cytoplasm, they are then used to resynthesize the triglyceride, uh, triglycerides. Why? Well, because these actually need to make their way to the target cells, the fat cells, and the muscle cells.
and so triglycerides before actually making their way into the lymph system of our body they are placed into these carrier molecules ca uh, carrier particles known as chylomicrons. microns now a chylomicron micron basically consists of proteins cholesterol molecules phospholipid molecules fat soluble vitamins and other molecules but the predominant portion of these chylomicrons are triglycerides in fact triglycerides make up about 90 percent of the portion of the of, of the chylomicron now, once we form these chylomicrons, they then move into the limb system and then they travel into the blood plasma. And once inside the blood plasma, these chylomicrons move onto the membranes of target cells, so cells like adipose cells, fat cells, or muscle cells. And once they attach onto the membrane, they once again are broken down back into the fatty acids and monoacylglycerols, and then those are absorbed by that particular cell and so if we're talking about fat cells once these are ingested into the cell they are then con uh, converted back into triglycerides and then those tri and and then those triglycerides begin to basically aggregate together to form these large aggregate molecules known as fat globules so we see that the takeaway lesson from this particular lecture is the fact that these triglycerides are very, very specialized in the sense that they're very highly concentrated forms of energy storage. Compared to glycogen and protein, we're able to actually store much more potential energy within the fat molecules, the triglycerides, than the proteins or carbohydrate molecules.